Welcome to the talk Embedded Deep Learning Simple Resolution on GStreamer using Onyx Inference Runtime. I'm Marcus Edel, I'm a machine learning engineer at Collabora and for the past couple of years I've been working on using machine learning to improve video quality to deliver better quality video content. And today Aaron Box and I talk about Super Resolution, Super Resolution for Embedded Devices and how you can integrate Super Resolution into an existing GStreamer workflow using Onyx. Now, simple resolution is actually kind of an older technique. There are papers I found naming this from like the 80s, I'm talking about how if you have multiple low resolution frames with um, sub pixel offsets, you can use that to create better looking high resolution frames. I'm not gonna talk about that at all today because really what I'm gonna be talking about today is super resolution better scaling using machine learning. Now, the reason for this is that over the past few years, as machine learning has really taken off, the technique for building super resolution algorithms um, have, have really been completely dominated by machine learning to the point where they are essentially becoming um, synonymous with each other um, and that there aren't really any non-machine learning super resolution techniques out there that you really need to know about today. Um, so in this talk, what Aaron and I are talking about is I will start with a bit of an overview about why scaling, specifically upscaling, matters to us so much. I'm trying to give you an overview about super resolution, present you a couple of key papers and talk about our super resolution method that we developed. Then we will talk about how a specific super resolution that can be integrated into an existing workflow using Onyx and GStreamer. And at the end, we will give you a demo of how you can actually use super resolution so you can try it out yourself as well. Okay, let's dive in. Um, why do we need to scale? And there are really two main reasons why we scale. The first is we scale down then up as a low pass filter in order to get better uh, compression efficiency, um, better use of the available bit rates we have. And then more and more we need to scale up because we just don't have the content right now. Like if you have a really nice library of 1080p content and somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want all of this in 4K right now, like you can't really go back in time and reshoot that content. You have to scale if you um, want to create something like in 4K or even 8K. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about scaling down than up as a low pass filter, because this is actually one of the key concepts about the convex hull. Um, looking at this image, one of the axes here, I have the resolution of the video. On the other axis, I have the bitrate. And then we have a ton of uh, encodes of a fairly low complexity piece of content showing what the resulting uh, VMA F score or quality of that video was at each point. And then highlighted in red, you can see the resolution, which maximizes quality for each bitrate along this curve. And inherent to this picture is that the, is that notion that we are going to need to do a lot of scaling. In fact, if we want to deliver a great 1K encode, we are not going to deliver our 1080p encode for this piece of content. So scaling lets us make better use of our bitrate, and it's one of the key insights underpinning that notion of what the um, convex hull is. So how do we scale? What methods do we use? And uh, it's uh, basically a solved problem, right? Um, you can just use um, B-cubic interpolation, or maybe some guy on Stack Overflow is going to tell you to do this um, license. Um, uh, let's test it out. So I'm going to take the specific piece of content at 1080p. Netflix made this available for free. And for this test, I'm just going to go from the 1080p resolution. I'm going to scale down using a few different algorithms that you might have seen before. And then I'm going to scale back up using um, by cubic. I'm not actually going to the process at all. I'm just going to show you the data, which essentially confirms some of that insight. Um, nearest neighbor is down there at the bottom. Don't use that. Um, BDNR is way worse than by cubic and um, Lanzos does win by a small margin. Then when we are going the other way, scaling up, I'm going to pick the best algorithms line source. I'm going to scale up using a few different methods. And here is the result and the data for that. 
And in this case, you can see again, Lionsworth is winning by a small margin, by cubic is up there and nearest neighbor is doing something strange and bilinear is worst. And the point here is when we are scaling, the choice of method um, can have a huge impact in the quality um, of our encode. So you really need to pay attention to um, scaling. And with that in mind, I hope you are all interested in scaling because now I'm talking about the future of scaling, which is super resolution. And we start by defining super resolution. So super resolution is a pretty straightforward task where we have a low resolution input image and we want to produce a high resolution version of that image. That's the whole idea. Now, uh, what's the relationship between the two, uh, the two images here? Well, we assume that every pixel in the low resolution image was generated from the surrounding pixels in the high resolution image. And these areas are connected by a block kernel K and subsampling alpha, meaning K runs on the high resolution image and produces um, from a specific amount of pixels a single pixel in the low resolution image. And this is obviously a high pulsed um, problem, even when we know this kernel, even when we have knowledge about it. Um, this is highly ill posed because we want to produce more pixels than what we have in our hands. And it turns out that currently the best methods to do image upscaling obviously use deep learning, such as EDSR and RDN. Both use a very complex and sophisticated networks, but both methods actually assume a lot of knowledge about this kernel K. Not only assume knowledge about it, but also um, the method assume it's constant across all the images in the world. But uh, it turns out uh, when this assumption does not hold, like for images that are not part of the training set, so images in the wild, images we take with our smartphones or we download from the internet, um, those images, um, those methods uh, perform poorly. And this phenomena gave rise to what's now called in the field of machine learning blind super resolution. And um, blind super resolution, all it does, it uh, assumes explicitly that we do not know the kernel. So blind super resolution has no information about the kernel itself. And in this presentation, we approach this question mark here and also show that based on that, we are able to design a much smaller network that can, if optimized, run on a resource constraint device. So in summary, in this talk, we will show, given only the input image, we can estimate the um, image-specific super-resolution kernel, which will greatly improve the quality of the upscaled image, but also allows us to design a more optimized, smaller model. And uh, we do it in, in a completely unsupervised way using zero examples other than the test image itself, so with no external data. And when we combine these two, we achieve actually state-of-the-art super-resolution um, uh, results. And maybe a more important contribution is that we achieve like um, a large step forward uh, for super-resolution in the white that not only runs on desktop PCs, but on resource-constrained devices as well. But before we jump in, let's take a look at uh, what the majority of deep learning methods um, do these days. And mainly those methods um, take a large data set of high resolution images and downscale them by um, blurring and subsampling. And now they have like pairs of low resolution images and high resolution images. With that, they can just take any neural network and train it to undo this um, downscaling process and to essentially produce a super resolution image. And now at test time, they can apply this trained network to any new image and produce a super resolution image from a low resolution image. It's a standard supervised framework. Um, they're generally speaking and very generally speaking are um, three families of methods. Um, the first one does exactly this type of training. It um, implicitly assumes a single kernel because as you can see here uh, in the downscanning, it did it with a single specific kernel K and by that, what it's actually training the network to do is to undo this um, downscaling. And by that, they assume that the kernel is uh, the same for all the images in the world. Um, a second family of um, super resolution methods is trying to be um, agnostic to the kernel, meaning that they are trying to produce a super resolution image 
um, regardless of the kernel, without uh, any information about the kernel. And those methods, uh, what they do is instead of um, downscaling with uh, one specific kernel K, they downscale with a um, number of kernels and in this uh, way they actually um, take a, lar a large number of images and a large number of um, kernels down sample and by that hopefully at test time they are able to upscale an image without any knowledge about the kernel just because they use um, not only one kernel to train the model but multiple kernels. Um, the third family assumes that they receive a kernel of the image, which of course is a very strong assumption because when I take a photo with my smartphone, I don't get the um, kernel with um, the image. So that's where we come into the picture. And the model we implemented will provide those families of um, super resolution models with that image specific kernel. Um, but before we jump in, let's first um, look at some examples of these um, families. So when the assumption about the fixed kernel holds, it turns out that deep neural networks um, actually produce very good um, images. So here you can see the low resolution image that was downsampled with a specific kernel. And this is just um, simple interpolation, while this is state of the art super resolution. And when we flicker between the two, note how details are enhanced and the image is cleaner and much closer to the um, ground truth image. But when we take them just a simple step sideways outside of their comfort zone, where this assumption does not hold anymore, and there's a different unknown kernel, well, this is still simple by cubic interpolation, and this is state-of-the-art super resolution. So just to recap, this is state of the art, assuming a single kernel across all the images in the world, which is obviously a poor assumption. And when we flicker between the two, it's hard to tell any difference. But if we go ahead and compare them to the third family of methods, where the method assumes someone gave them that image kernel, this is what they do. And if we flicker between the two, you can see how state-of-the-art super resolution does not perform as good as well as um, the super resolution method that assumes that the kernel was given. So the main takeaway is that the kernel is more important than the method. Um, not only uh, when we talk about image quality, but also um, performance, because if we know the kernel, the kernel is given, we have the chance to design a much simpler, smaller model as well. So let's continue with the question, what is a super resolution kernel? And more importantly, how do we estimate the kernel? And if we go back to the problem definition, we have the um, input image, and we also want to estimate the unknown high resolution image. Um, they are related, as I said before, by some blur with um, the, the kernel and subsampling. And this is the super resolution kernel. This is what we are trying to estimate. And this is also the kernel that the method from the third family of um, super resolution methods assume they get. And um, what we used to estimate the kernel was defined by Sefi Bell Klinger, Asaf Sofar, and Mikhail uh, Irani as an internal GAN. And the idea of the uh, internal GAN is shown here. So an internal GAN um, gets the input image as the only input it sees. It has no other images and the generator is, um, aims to downscale this image and fool the discriminator as in every GAN. So after um, it downscales the image, we take um, crops from the input image as uh, fake crops and crops from the input image from, um, uh, from the real input image as real crops. And uh, the discriminator now tries to distinguish between the two and find out who is a fake crop and who is a real crop. But it um, doesn't do it as in a normal GAN will do it, uh, which is usually a single number of how likely it is that the given crop is real or fake, but instead it outputs a map of pixels. A map of pixels where each pixel represents how likely it is um, that the patch is um, coming from a real or fake crop. And if the discriminator can distinguish between real crops from the input image and fake crops from the generator, it means um, the simula simularity is maximized. 
And if that is the case, it means that the um, generator is imitating exactly the super resolution kernel. And this is what we are trying to do. Um, however, estimating a proper downsampler from a single input image is um, complicated, especially in the presence of noise uh, or other artifacts. We often fail to estimate good um, degradation parameters. And a wrong degradation um, severely reduces the effectiveness of the upscaler and reduces the um, super resolution performance. And with the true downsampler, uh, downsampler one can um, data mine the upsampler more accurately. Um, and on the other hand, with the um, true upsampler, one can correctly estimate the downsampler. In other words, um, the upsampler and downsampler are the inverse um, of each other and improve, uh, improving one can also improve the other. Uh, and this, basically, this relationship motivated us to simultaneously train both the upsampler and downsampler in a single pipeline. So unlike kernel gun, the upsampler and downsampler are trained simultaneously and improve each other using the cycle consistency loss, which is shown here on this slide. Now we have this network that can estimate our super resolution kernel as well as use that kernel to upscale an image. But we, what we haven't shown here is how do we find the really small deep learning um, network in comparison with other methods? Well, um, traditionally, the, the deployment of efficient deep learning uh, can be split into model architecture design and uh, model compression, namely pruning and quantization, where model pruning uh, involves removing like parameters uh, that don't impact the network accuracy. And network quantization involves replacing data type um, with reduced uh, width data types, for example, replacing 32-bit floating point with 8-bit integers. And the ways can often be encoded um, to preserve more information than um, simple conversions. Um, some existing works have shown that such a sequential pipeline can significantly reduce the cost of existing uh, models. Nevertheless, careful hyperparameter uh, hyper tuning is required to obtain um, the optimal performance. And to this end, we use a method that is called um, APQ that was proposed by Titian Wang and his team, which is a joint design method to enable end-to-end -end search of um, model architecture, pruning and quantization policy um, with light cost. And the core idea of APQ is to use a uh, quantization aware accuracy predictor to accelerate the um, thrust process. And the predictor takes the model architecture, the quantization scheme as input and can quick, uh, quickly predict um, its accuracy instead of fine tuning the pruned and quantized network to get the accuracy. So to get a small deep learning model that can run on a resource constrained device, we mainly relied on a semi-automated methods, um, namely APQ, that paired with some time, we were able to, to reduce the model size we started with. Now, if we take our optimized model design, um, we can see some interesting results. And with that, I hand it over to Aaron. Thanks, Marcus. And now I'm going to talk about the qualitative and the quantitative results that we got when we apply these different methods to real-world images. So starting with the qualitative results, we'll begin with the nearest neighbor interpolation on this image. And you can see how pixelated the result is. It's very poor quality. Next is by cubic interpolation. We get a little bit better image quality, but it's still quite blurry, especially around the fine details around the edges. So the next slide is the first of the deep learning super resolution approaches. You can see a dramatic improvement in image quality with VDSR approach. And then there's EDSR, and just pay specific attention to the detail boxes on the right to see the differences in performance with these different methods. That's EDSR, then there's RCAN, and finally, our own approach to super resolution. And now we will talk about the quantitative results. This is a table comparing 
the different approaches to super resolution on a couple of different data sets at different upscaling factors. And we used two commonly used measures for lossy codecs. Uh, one is PSNR and one is SSIM. And our results are on the far right in red. And you can see that generally we are matching or exceeding the performance of the other methods for upscaling. Now part of this project was to run these methods on an edge device, which is extra challenging because an edge device typically is low in memory, low power, and low compute capabilities. So for this part of the project, we chose the Vim3 from Amlogic, and this SOC has a NPU on board, and that's a neural processing unit, which is what we ran our models on. And you can see that our approach, the model is significantly smaller in size than EDSR, for example, and this is particularly important for an edge device, which are memory constrained, and that translates into lower power usage, and also it contributes to the higher performance on the frame rate. And you can see that uh, at an upscaling factor of two, we are over three times faster than EDSR, and for a higher upscaling factor of four, we're about twice as fast as the EDSR approach. So these are some nice results. Next, I'm going to talk about how we enabled uh, the application of these new methods to real-world multimedia workflows by integrating our model into GStreamer. Now, GStreamer is everyone's favorite multimedia framework. It is pipeline-based, so it makes it quite easy to create custom bespoke workflows for video and audio processing. One other nice thing about GStreamer is it has very broad hardware support, so besides the CPU and the G discrete GPUs, it supports a host of smaller power devices on the edge. For the inference part of our approach, we chose Onyx runtime and file format uh, currently, there is quite a lot of fragmentation among the different AI toolkits for training a model. There is TensorFlow, PyTorch, CAFE, MLPack, uh, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, and a host of other different toolkits you can use to train your model. The nice thing about Onyx is it provides a single runtime that you can target with various backends that you can configure at runtime. So as long as you can convert the model to the Onyx file format and the operations are supported in Onyx, you can just use a single runtime to target various types of hardware. And from previous work that Marcus and I have done, uh, Onyx is already integrated into GStreamer. Uh, our previous project was to create an object detector uh, element called Onyx Object Detector. And this is upstreamed currently. It will be released in the upcoming 1.20 release of GStreamer. And here is an example of a GStreamer pipeline that is performing object detection on images. And you can see bounding boxes and labels displayed in the frame. So given that Onyx was already there for us, we created a new element in a merge request called Onyx Super Resolution. Um, this is quite similar to the object detector, and the parameters that you would pass in would be the model that you are using, um, the upscaling factor, and you can decide which backends backend you want to use for the inference. Currently, um, CPU and CUDA are the two backends that are supported in. GStreamer. And this is the merge request, so uh, feel free to check it out and um, try it out for yourself. And now we're going to show you 
uh, the this new element running in a GStreamer pipeline to perform upscaling. First off, I'm going to show you a video of the input uh, clip. This is a 480p clip of a running race. And now here is a GStreamer pipeline doing upscaling of that clip into 1080p. And look carefully to measure the quality of the result. That looks quite good. That's all for today. We both want to thank you very much for taking the time to listen to our talk. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, please stick around for the Q&A. You can also reach out to us at um, our site, collabor.com. We have a number of blog posts covering our super resolution work. You can check those out, um, make some comments if you like. And we're also hiring. So uh, thanks again, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.